So can I say thank you for coming this afternoon to the, this supply chain debate here in the studio school. Um, I'm Richard Mould and I'm a councillor with both Charwell and Bister Town Council and I will chair the event this afternoon. Uh, my background prior to retirement was in food logistics so I have some experience of the, of the logistics industry. Uh, shortly I will ask our panel members to give a brief introduction and then we'll go into the debate. If I can just set the scene, as we know the Charwell district is growing rapidly with some 27,000 house, houses planned across the district during the life of the current local plan and significant space allocated for employment. In the 12, past 12 months in Bristol alone, planning permission has been granted for around 200,000 square metres of B8 building along with other areas for B1, B2 commercial development and office accommodation. There's also hotel and uh, retail complex. And of course, Vista Village has just opened another 30 plus uh, shops. Similar developments taking place in both Banbury and Kidlington and we've seen uh, they've had their permissions granted. The Charwell area forming part of the Oxford, Cambridge, Nodditch Spine uh, or various other names that have been attributed welcomes inward investment and recently took space at the Midbin event in Olympia, ably supported by this division, um, where many areas of the UK were represented.
current imbalance of our commuting against working in Vista, we need to attract a broad range of employment uh, to persuade our current and new residents to stay in the local area. So with those thoughts in mind, uh, if I can ask the panel to introduce themselves, and if I start with Richard. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Brown. I'm the principal of Vista Tech Studio, um, the school that we're in right now. Uh, we're in our second year of operation. Uh, we were conceived in 2012 um, as part of the, the sort of plans for Vista to help provide a workforce. Uh, and logistics uh, is a key part of that vision. Uh, so that's why we're here, and, and hopefully tonight will you know, help get us a little bit closer to understanding that. Thank you. I'm John Liggins, and I'm here to represent Vista Vision today. I'm one of the uh, executive members of Vista Vision. Uh, Vista Vision, for those of you who don't know, and I suspect nearly all of you do, is almost unique in the country in that it's a real working partnership between all three tiers of local authority county, district and town, as well as private enterprise, and it's through that route that we at Vista Vision can represent the needs of the community, be they the existing businesses uh, in Vista who are looking to expand or have issues that they need uh, resolving, whilst at the same time looking at the future development and the creation of new jobs and employment opportunities throughout the area of Vista. We work closely with the LEP. Uh, and through that route, we want to help as many of our young students coming from here as we possibly can, finding their employment opportunities. Hello, uh, I'm Andy Kay. Um, I'm the chief executive of a business called Biz Henderson. Um, we've got 40 employees, a couple of offices, one in Northampton and one in High Wycombe. Um, and we do four key things. Uh, the recruitment business that we run is probably one of the top three recruitment com consultancies in the logistics sector. So we'll recruit managers into the industry from uh, middle management up to chief executive. Uh, and therefore, um, myself and my team are fairly well placed to give you some advice on the kinds of individuals and also the kind of roles that are in the logistics industry, what they pay, uh, and, the, and the challenges and demands that we have to try and find great people in the sector. Uh, the second business we run is a consulting company, so we're working with very large retailers, manufacturers, utility companies, tech companies, to work out where their logistics facilities should be in the country, not only in the UK, but actually across the world. So we do work globally, uh, and, and a large part in Europe. Um, but the consultants that we have in our business are working around network design, network modelling, uh, looking at ways of supplying product to, 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 to consumers, but also designing warehouses as well. So we do an inordinate amount of work with big retailers looking at how they get best use out of their space. And quite frankly, uh, I'm sure that what will come up is the use of automation uh, in, in warehousing today uh, to meet demand. Third, the third company we run is that we're very, very engaged in young people development. So we, <coughs> excuse me. we have our own academy. We run graduate schemes and we also run apprenticeship schemes to try and get more young people to think about logistics as a career of choice rather than just a job in a warehouse. Uh, and believe me, it's far from that these days. Um, so I, I've been asked to sit on this panel. I'm hoping I'll give you some insight into where the logistics industry is going, uh, where it was, and, and wh what it's going to be like in the future. Uh, and hopefully that might help you with uh, some of the decisions you're making around you know, the facilities you have in this, in this area. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name's Henry Chapman. I'm a director of DB Symmetry a supply chain um, logistics developer. We have a land bank of about 3,000 acres and we are currently expected to be building out a quarter of all the speculative development in the country, so we're about a million square feet on site at the moment in six buildings. We've been very involved in Cherwell District over the years, going back to probably the first warehouse built at Junction 10 of the M40. We're currently developing out 1.25 million square feet at Banbury where we've done the deals with HelloFresh and ProDrive. We've currently got two buildings we're in the process of letting at Banbury, and we've got detailed planning for another 550 odd thousand square feet. We have built out the first phase of our site at um, Symmetry Park Bista, which is on the A41, where we sold the first building to Bentley Design, and we're hopefully about to put under off for the second building. We are about to submit a detailed planning application for the next phase. Um, as part of our involvement in our BISTA scheme. We've been involved with the um, BISTA Tech School uh, through our Section 106. 
where we have a tie-in where students come on site three times during the construction process. So start on site when the steel's up and at practical completion. And then the occupiers through us have an obligation to tie in and try and get placements with the tech school. And I think we've just got the first placement through Benton Design with a couple of students. It's, it's, it's already been, been uh, yeah, agreed. agreed. So um, we've got a good tie in there. We do this across the country. We've got a Manchester office. We employ about 25 people. Um, we've got a similar Section 106 obligation at Lutterworth, where we just thought shortly to go to committee on Thursday night for 3 million square feet, um, with the same lock-in with the students um, there, which seems to be proving a successful. Yeah. Um, we have schemes all over the Midlands and north of England, and are probably one of the largest uh, land bank holders at the moment, pushing through planning for logistics warehousing. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, panel. I think you can, you can see that we've got a broad range of uh, experience and views um, I among our panel tonight. So if we, or this afternoon, can we go, if we go into the first question, um, that is one of the Vista Technology Studio's primary aims is to help pre prepare students for careers in business, specifically dynamic sectors that are projected to grow in the local area. How does the logistics sector fit into these? Uh, perhaps I can go to Richard first to... Uh, Thank you. Um, I'm going to use a, an example of a colleague uh, who isn't here. So one of our partners is uh, BMW Mini Plant Oxford. Uh, and the head of logistics of that plant in Oxford is our uh, specific partner at this school. And the question is, you know, what kind of students do you want? What sort of placements? And the answer is, there isn't anything specific. It's all about attributes of the students and transferable skills and can they work together and can they work and... Um, you know, projects and in teams and with other people. So at the age that we have the students, we will develop them in that way, but it's really, really important for students to get out and get into the workplace as part of their experience. And that happens in lots of different ways. Uh, employers can come in here and talk to students and set up projects. We've got several going at, at the moment. Um, students you know, can, can meet uh, people on, on events and networking events and things like that that we have. And we have students here tonight uh, over the back. Some of you might have met them when they were helping you park in the car park. Um, and then also we, ha we have students go out into the workplace, do a regular placement one or two days a week, or do you know, specific work. And you mentioned Bentley Designs. So Bentley Designs, um, in moving to Vista, didn't have the base to interview people to work in their new building. So we hosted all of that. And as a school, uh, we act as a bit of a hub, a, a network hub for businesses in the area. Um, so really, from our point of view, it's about engaging um, you know, with industry in general. Now, the specific question about logistics, I even heard this at, at the weekend on the radio, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you heard all of the um, bits and pieces from Andrew Adonis and the, the development we're talking about there. And uh, we keep putting in about industries of the future and automation that people wouldn't have jobs then, and I don't believe that for an instant. I think whatever we have with automation, people will be needed to add value to those jobs. The sure thing is that we don't know exactly what the mix of those jobs will be in 10 or 15 years' time, but we know that we'll need people who are doing the, have the right skills and they're embedded in those industries to keep them competitive, so we're at the sharp end of that. So what we would ask is that you know, businesses coming into the area, and especially growing businesses, you know, such huge ones like logistics, um, you know, have opportunities for students to get involved and help develop them. I'm very excited as well about some of your work at the degree level as well to, to push into that. So really from our point of view, um, you know, we're open to, to students being mapped into the industry at the very offset and giving them work with them to make sure that they have the right skills to succeed. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, Andy, would you like to uh, add anything to that? Yeah, yeah I think... Uh, um one of the big challenges that we have uh, as an industry in terms of logistics industry is, is the image of the industry. I think um, the, the logistics and supply chain sector has done singly nothing over the last 10 to 15 years to promote itself to you know, young people particularly uh, with regard to the amount of opportunities that are in the sector. And, and it is true to say that if you look at the way the logistics industry has grown, in large part that's on the back of the way that we now live our lives. Um, we are, you know, online shoppers. The UK has probably been the largest adopter of online shopping in the, in the, in the world, other than probably the States. Uh, and as a consequence of that, um, businesses had to move to source product all over the world to give 
consumers the best price, the best choice, the best availability. Uh, and, and by the way, they all want it yesterday. So when you go online and you shop, um, you've got the ability to price compare, you've got the ability to have the, del the product delivered. You probably have the, have the ability to have the, your old product taken away f and, uh, if necessary. Now all of that is logistics. And, and young people don't get that actually, that strangely huge amounts of technology, vast amounts of data, enormously complex algorithms used to order product all over the world, move the product, pay the duty, sort out the invoicing and the transportation. When it reaches the UK, clear customs, move to a warehouse, pick in a warehouse via automation or not, and then deliver the final mile solution to a client or to, or to a customer. That is all logistics. And the number of jobs that are in that particular industry are vast and varied. Um, HR, finance, engineering, um, operations, marketing, purchasing, they're all part of logistics in some shape or form. And unfortunately, the sector gets tarnished with the fact that if you work in logistics, you work in a warehouse or you drive a lorry. Now, let's be honest, of course, you, there, there, are, there are jobs that do that. Yeah? And there are some fairly low-skilled levels of jobs, but they're becoming less and less and less. The way the industry is now moving is very much more technology-driven, very much more around mechanization and automation, albeit, you know, it, 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 and it still does need jobs. Very much more around engineering in terms of maintaining the equipment. And it's all about planning and processes. That needs high levels of intellect, high levels of uh, analytical capability. And we need more young people to come into this sector. We desperately need more young people. And that's one of the reasons why I've set up, personally set up, three degree programs with two, two major universities, one at Aston with their business school, and also with the University of Huddersfield, where we're bringing c c young people through their degree programs. We've got 25 companies who are sponsoring those programs, people like Sainsbury's and DHL, people like Morrison's, ASOS, Arla Foods, Travis Perkins, who are providing those young people with mentoring opportunities, providing them with work placements, providing them actually, if they get a 2-1 or better, with a guaranteed job. And these companies are not doing it lightly. They're doing it because they need the people. And unfortunately, the industry has just got that image. So the question I would ask is, if I, for any young person coming into the sector, um, if they, if they don't know anything about logistics, then go out and find something about logistics because the opportunities are huge. And, and the jobs are very well paid when you, when, when you, when you, at all levels, at, at all levels, certainly well over the average. So, yeah. Okay, thank you, Andy. Just a question on that. If, how do you get that message across to students and to the wider public? Um, one of the things I've, I feel in terms of planning, for instance, that we get an outline planning application we haven't got a clue what's actually going to happen in that, in that shed. And so therefore, it's very difficult to know what value it will add. So it, it's how do we overcome those sorts of issues? I, th I think, um, for me, it's about talking about the types of roles that exist in the sector and, and, and talking through particularly the management roles and the planning roles. Um, and the fact that you know, any, si any site, any warehouse will have a management team. It will start at the general manager, who is the, effectively the, the CEO of the site. That general manager could be earning anything between 75 to 100,000 pounds a year, company car, 25% bonus, and so on and so forth. Below that individual, that, the, there will then be a structure of at least 30 to 40 other managers doing anything from operations management, planning, HR, finance, procurement, who are earning anything between 35 to 70,000 pounds a year. Before we get to the shop floor where the operatives, depending on the level they are and the shift patterns that they're working on, who will be using technology in that, se in that sector could be earning anything between 18 to 25,000 pounds a year. So, you know, it's about explaining the roles that are going on in this warehouse. And, and that's notwithstanding the fact that be before you've actually physically operated a warehouse or indeed designed the warehouse, there's a huge amount of planning that needs to go into the operation of a supply chain and also the procurement of all the product. So people sat in head offices, where, wherever that may be, procuring product, managing the movement of product, and so on and so forth. It's all logistics. Okay, thank you. Uh, Henry, would you like to uh, add something to that? The warehouses we build, in many instances, we're basically putting a wrapping around a hugely complex um, automotive system inside it. Um, the, we've been building warehouses for 25 years. In fact, 
our company built the first ever 100,000 square foot warehouse in Brack Mills in Northampton in the 1980s. We've seen a huge change in what goes into these buildings. And to steal a quote from somebody else, far more famous, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it almost is everything. Logistics sector has seen huge, huge inward investment. investment. Love or hate Amazon, but they've spent in the UK in the last seven years 6.4 billion pounds, and they've invested nearly a billion pounds. That's inward investment, and the only way you're going to create growth in this country is through investment. And by investing, it's either getting someone to do their job more efficiently or creating a new job for them to do efficiently. And the logistics sector is one of the few sectors during the recession which carried on inward investment. The sector grew by 40% during the recession when pretty much every other industry retracted. And we're building these warehouses. We put a concrete slab down and put some cladding around. But what actually goes in the building is frequently multiples and multiples of the money we spend building the warehouse. We're building a warehouse 35 pounds a foot. What goes into that building can be 10 times the cost of what we build. The sector is growing exponentially. 87% of people in the UK bought at least one product online last year. And the e-commerce sector is continuing to grow with lots of different range of forecasts, but we can all guarantee one thing. It's here to stay and it's growing. And with that comes a huge investment. And going back to Andy's point, to, to achieve these growth and this investment, people are being upskilled. You know, these aren't just driving around in a forklift truck in a brown coat going back to the 1980s. This is a hugely complex industry. And we're building the warehouses for them. We're at the coalface talking to them about their fit outs, their offices. Annual take up of offices in Bicester last year, I think it was under 10,000 square feet. I think that's pretty much every year. And um, a couple of agents in the room, I'm sure, better um, verify that. Every time we build a warehouse, we're doubling, trebling the amount of office take up for that town. So we did the Bentley design deal was 18,000 square feet of offices. That's two years take up of offices for Bicester. That's on top of all the jobs in the warehouse. Hopefully, we're putting this up building under offer. They're going to cre increase the offices to hopefully about 15,000 square feet. They're putting laboratories into it. And again, a huge inward investment, skilled labor. And going back to your point about the outline application, we have a large site. The outline planning application process is purely the concept of, can we build a use on this site? Very, very outline principles. Height of the ridge, the building, landscaping around, point of access. You know, we don't know who's going to come and take these buildings. But the only way you can get people to come is by granting an outline planning consent. You know, we've got a great example at the moment. Travis Perkins are based in Northampton, employing five, 600 people. They're about to leave Northampton because they have no land allocated for them to go to. So they're now looking at moving to Milton Keynes, taking all those jobs with them. So Northampton going to lose the rates and the staff, and there's 38,000 square feet of offices in that building. So that we, we see a huge upward investment train with logistics, and it's only going to carry on. But to maintain those jobs and to maintain those companies, you have to have the land allocated to attract those companies, which will then employ the people. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, John, do you want to... Uh... Well, I think it's largely been said, Richard, but I think from uh, the point of view of Vista Vision observing what, what, what is happening in this sector, I think the first thing we have to accept, of course, is that Vista is ideally located for lots of different opportunities that involve collection or delivery, if I can put it like that, for vehicle movement. Uh, just because of where it's located, um, that in itself brings issues about uh, vehicle pressure in the town, and, and I think from this division's point of view, part of my brief is, is, is that we need to look carefully at where these, where these buildings are located. But over and above that, I would say very much as Richard has pointed out, He's a member of the planning committee. I'm sure there are others here who are members of the planning committee. The current planning system doesn't really suit what we're talking about because what it doesn't do is tell you whether it's one man inside in a brown overall driving a forklift truck or whether it is, as Henry said, lots of offices, laboratories. There's all sorts of opportunities. And I think we need to all learn to look at this in a different way in order to assess what it is that developers, uh, 
businesses want to create in Vista. Uh, Vista Vision is very aware that there are a number of businesses in Vista, just like the Travis Perkins conversation in Northampton, where these businesses don't really have much opportunity to expand on their current site. And there have been discussions over many years that I can remember now about people who said, well, actually, we can't stay in Vista any longer because we can't get what we want. And historically, I think, Henry, you built the building at Banbury, did you? That, um, the oh, you built the ones next door. Yeah. But that building there in Banbury has got a couple of hundred jobs yeah. in it. Yeah. First line, the first line building. Yeah. And first line left Vista because they couldn't get the facility that they want. So there were about 200 jobs lost to Vista there. Similarly at Banbury, ProDrive have a fabulous new building there. And I can't tell you how many people work in there, but lots. Yeah. Um, and from Vista Vision's point of view, it's very much as we were talking about, it's creating opportunities at all levels, all sorts of jobs. So all I would say to everybody from Vista Vision's point of view is think about not just this is a big shed, think about what can go on inside it. Okay, thanks, Sean. Right, if we take our, our next question. Uh, this event is called Unlocking the Potential of the M40 Corridor for Charwell. What does this mean and how do we do it? Um, perhaps I go to Henry first for that one. So we have um, warehouse sites up and down, well, all over the country. And something we're seeing more and more is a reluctance for occupiers to go to the M1. There's huge traffic congestion on the M1. And as Andy Lee made a point earlier, logistics is point of time delivery. The 660,000 vehicle movements a week on the M40, which is a fraction of the M1, it has far less congestion. Um, we have sites, as I said, at Banbury and Vista, and we have very, very strong interest in all, in all the sites. And this is being driven by a realization by occupiers that actually Cherwell offers a fantastic position to locate to. We've got a very skilled workforce, access to London, West London in an hour and 20. You can get to Birmingham in an hour. You can get to 75% of the UK population in a four hour drive time which is very important due to, to um, tachometer drive times for lorries. So they can service Southampton up to Manchester and across down to the southwest from Banbury, Vista. The, um, at the moment, we have sites allocated, but to get a site allocated takes years and also million, million, millions and millions of pounds of investment. So just put into context, our outline planning application at Bista for 670,000 square feet cost nearly a million pounds. There's a huge amount of time and investment to get to the point where you have a site which an occupier will look at. What you have to appreciate is if you grant planning consents in the wrong locations, occupiers will not come. If you look at the Travis Perkins example, and Andy made the comment, they're hugely sophisticated models and where they will locate. So you have to put grants and allocate sites on at locations which occupiers will come to. I think a good example is the Bister Office Park. It's been consented now for seven years and no development has happened. We've seen across our desk time and again the funding brochures for it. It's sat redundant. We've had planning consent for 12 months at Bister. We've now built out 170,000 square feet and hopefully will have by the end of by Christmas let the second building and created several hundred jobs. But you've got to look forward because the planning is a long, long game. And I know we're talking about the budget and trying to free up housing numbers, but whichever way you look at it, by the time you've been through a draft local plan, adoption of the plan, examination in public, Secretary of State then potential call in, that's the allocation stage. We then put a planning application in. It takes us a year to put a planning application in. It might take another year to get it determined. By the time you've been through the JR, then an infrastructure application, then a detailed application, you're five years from start to finish at best. So for Cherwell, it's saying we've got 27,000 houses coming online over the next 15 years. We've got to provide jobs with those. And what jobs are they going to be? Because we can grant, Bister, we can grant consents for Bister Office Park, we can grant all these different types. But what actually is going to create the jobs? And, and we've been talking about, we believe, and we obviously are in the sector, we're big fans of it, that they are the right jobs for Cherwell. There's a broad cross-section of them. They are well paid, they're above the national average. They're much below the, um, in terms of part-time employment contracts, they're much below the average. I think it's 15% versus 28%. The logistics sector's moved on fundamentally over the last 25 years. 
But the M40 corridor is now a location which occupiers will look at. Waitrose are very keen to come here when we started looking at our site at, um, down the A41. They couldn't come because the site wasn't allocated. And the companies have to have certainty of delivery because they're going to invest tens, hundreds of millions of pounds in their buildings. And to do that, they have to have the absolute certainty that the local authority is there to work with them and achieve the consent which can then be built out and hit their point of time. Because they'll be coming out of another building to go into that building and the ramifications financially down the line are enormous. So to our end, it's simple. It's looking at the local plan review cycles and having the foresight to allocate land which will be occupiers can then look at and make long-term strategic decisions on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, John, do you like to comment on that? I think what can, what can BISTA and the M40 unlock? I think it can unlock a lot of things, but actually what it needs to unlock is the ability to provide jobs and career jobs for the people coming through education, coming to live in all these houses that are being built in BISTA with increasing pressure in Oxfordshire to take more housing outside the city of Oxford. I know there are a number of councillors here. Constant pressure. What we don't want, as Vista Vision, I can say with absolute certainty, is masses of out-commuting, increasing out-commuting. We want to see opportunities created in Vista, in whatever sector, because the, uh, the professor and the lady on the till in Sainsbury's may be extremes of different kinds of employment, but actually we need to provide for the whole spectrum. And I have come to believe, personally, that actually logistics, people think about the man on the forklift truck, or they think about all the truck drivers. What they don't think about is what goes on inside that building and what the skills are necessary to go on inside that building, which takes me back to the planning system being inappropriate for what we are now trying to create in a country that is not really a manufacturer any longer in any great terms. It's actually a supplier of goods. Yeah, well, that, that's what I'm trying to say. B8 is, is it, it, the sort of B1, B2, 8 categorization just doesn't work for anybody any longer. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, obviously, B1 is mainly offices with a little bit of light industrial. B2 is manufacturing. And B8 is logistics and distribution. Um, but actually, it doesn't really apply any longer. Um, and uh, that would take me back to, for example, uh, the ProDrive building at, at Banbury. Uh, which is a prize example. Uh, so I think we need to think in a different way about this. And I would say from the point of view of Vista Vision that everybody should look at what the opportunities for creation are because we are in a very special location here. We've got lots of people buying houses here, coming to live here, uh, either in the, in the villages, in, in the affluent housing, or in the new eco houses in the town, or the new houses that need to be constructed around the town. We need to provide the opportunities for those people, and Vista Vision are very, very keen to promote Vista to do that. And this is one of the areas where we must promote it. Without kind of replicating what the guys have just said, um, what, what business needs, with all of the uncertainty that we have in the economy at this moment in time, business needs lack of risk and it needs certainty and it needs clarity about where it's going. Organisations spend millions and millions of pounds planning what their businesses are going to look like for the next five years, ten years, fifteen years. And they try and deal with uncertainty all of the time around what's going on around Brexit, what's going on around our exchange rates, what's the government going to look like, what, what's the government policy going to be in the future, and how does that look like for, how they're, for, for, the, recru for the recruitment and employment, you know, uh, legal, legal, the legal employment legislation around all of that. It's lots of uncertainty. What they do know is that retail, manufacturing, and services is here to stay. The way that people buy product is changing, and the way that people are living their lives is changing. But what they do also know is that there is more information now around consumerism than ever before. Because we shop online and we use computers, organizations know where you go on holiday, they know where you live, they know what car you drive. They know what your buying patterns are. They know with a degree of certainty, yeah, what you're going to be doing in the supermarket on Tuesday afternoon. 
And do you know what? They target you with marketing. Okay? There's some very, very, very clever stuff going on that you're not even aware of. You know, something drops into your email or something drops through your letterbox, and strangely, that's actually quite relevant to my lifestyle. I might be interested in buying that. That's come from the big data mentality, yeah, and the predictive analytics that's now going on in modern retailing. Yeah? They are trying to predict the future. And you know what? Some of them are getting really good at it. But it's about trying to predict certainty. So for me, to unlock the value of, of the location you have here, if you can provide certainty by allocating uh, um, land to development, yeah, then big business will come here. Okay, thank you. I mean, um, we, the Charwell local plan, which is 2011 to 2031, does provide, I think, a certain amount of certainty in terms of development land that, that's been allocated uh, around Vista and around the rest of the uh, rest of the district. So hopefully we've got some certainty uh, in, in where we're going over the next 15, 20 years. I think take-up will be much faster than people predict. Last year was a record year for logistics take-up, just under 24 million square feet. This year it will be in line with UK average, five-year average of about 20 million square feet. The take-up is exponential growth, really, of new sites. If people want, logistics industry is developed, people want new buildings because they're investing so much money into the buildings. And I think you'll find sites that have been allocated will be taken up very quickly. You know, I think, uh, looking at Tom here, who's running our um, Vista site, you know, we're hoping to be at the first phase away by the end of this year. And I certainly hope that the second phase are gone by the end of next year, and we're out of it the year after that. And that's 675,000 square feet, all gone. And our, Bistus, our Banbury site, same. And I'd be disappointed if it wasn't fully let and completed within the next two years. And you know, where do you go from you know, That's a big chunk of land. That's a huge amount of jobs creation. And that's 125 million pounds of investment into Banbury by us. But the next phase, if, you, if more land is allocated, more occupiers will come. Um, and I think the take up is probably greater, quicker than people will um, assume. Well, that's, that's interesting, thank you. Okay, if we move on then to our final question. Um, so what are the key challenges for Vista as a town over the next 15 years, and how would you propose that we overcome them? And I think we've touched on some of that, but John, if you'd like to uh, go first on this one. Well, I think the big challenge is with this hugely growing population of the town of Vista to provide opportunity at all levels for the people who live here, be they adults, be they students, be they those over the next 20 years who are probably only just being born now, um, that, that we have to provide that opportunity. And actually, uh, to be fair to my colleagues on the right, I think the construction of office parks is a very rare commodity in the country nowadays and is very much defined around particular locations um, within the M25, for example. Um, uh, so we have to be broad-minded about how we look at creating these opportunities and in doing so we have to find a way of establishing that those opportunities can provide the jobs we need. So that is I think our challenge now for a vastly growing population both in and around Vista. Thank you. Um, Richard. It's in interesting, I was just reflecting on that and, and I'm originally from Newcastle, and uh, Newcastle always got a really hard time in the 1980s, and we're giggling at. But uh, because as a city, it was only ever about 240,000 people big on the actual boundaries of, of the city itself, where it served three and a half million people. And the mess of the infra infrastructure in the area and the different councils that were involved, it just couldn't really get itself together, I think, until the sort of early, mid-90s, and then um, things really started to move there. And I'm thinking about Vista being in a position of where it is now and how different it will be and how much bigger it will be. It's a really beautiful centre, you know, that old market town in the centre and the development that's gone on. I think it's a real asset. And when you look at it as a centre in this area, you know, it, it's got a hell of a lot of potential. And all of these, um, you know, we're talking largely about businesses and office parks and things like that. But the people that live here need to still you know, feel that they're in a town that works for them living here. The people that don't live here, and they live in little villages around and about, need to be able to benefit from getting in and out of Vista 
um, really easily. And I just, I, I would hope that that wouldn't be lost in the development that happens. But I think Vista has got loads of potential, but it's really careful. It needs to be joined up and it needs to be really carefully planned and projected ahead. Um, having said that, um, just thinking more sort of selfishly, um, we actively try and engage uh, with businesses in the area and, and actually have no problem. There's lots of networking um, and that's, that's great. So I'll just say to really make sure that, you know, maybe at a slightly different level, that's sort of em em embedded and our work with, with Vista Vision is, is fantastic and that, but I think that needs to keep happening and keep those conversations going, keep different parties in Vista talking to each other. Thanks, Richard. If we can pass it to Henry, let's give you an opportunity to set the scene for the next 15 years. I think there's a huge opportunity for Bicester. When you look at the Oxford-Cambridge proposed link and then the proximity of Bicester to Oxford as a city, um, Oxford's surrounded by Greenbelt. You know, if you can imagine a donut, the outside of it is Greenbelt. And there's huge constraints of growth on Oxford. And I think from a, from a business point of view, I think there is really not much more land can come forward for development. And there's a massive opportunity for Bicester to capitalise on that, especially with the new link, um, the new train link. Fast forward 10 years, 15 years, and you've got the um, Oxford-Cambridge link, which is the route is undecided as yet. But if Bicester can get themselves somehow into that picture, I think there's a fantastic opportunity to almost Bicester to become an almost an extension of Oxford to the north with the, the fantastic connections around you know, the sub southeast of the country. Um, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking, the project. It, it's got legs now, it seems to be gathering momentum. And there's been a report out in the last few days um, by um, Bridget Rosewell talking about the benefits of it, and the government seems to be buying into it. But Bicester has a real opportunity to jump on that bandwagon. And you know, with careful planning and the right allocation of land, I mean, clearly there's a massive task ahead because the numbers coming out of Oxford for housing are a problem for not just um, Cherwell, but the four districts surrounding Oxford. But I think you, you know, it was seen as a positive and positive planning took place. I think the town's got every opportunity to um, capitalise on it. Okay, thank you. Um, Andy, would you like to have the final word on this one? Yeah, I th I th look, I'm, without get, again repeating, um, it's about jobs, it's about prosperity, it's about variation, it's about wealth, it's about helping local communities, it's about help, helping local businesses. Um, business provides job, jobs provide income, income provides an economy, a local economy, and that's the opportunity that you have. You, you are, you know, in a fantastic part of the country, as Henry, Henry's very articulately <laughs> said, in terms of the benefits that you have and the opportunity that you have, if you don't do it, somebody else will. And, and I think that's a key message, actually. Uh, if you don't do it, somebody else will. Uh, they will be eating your lunch, and you have an opportunity at this moment in time to take and grasp the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're running slightly ahead of schedule, but I think we'll go to, I'm sure you've got lots of questions to ask, so we'll go to, uh, to, to question time first. Debbie. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you all, and I'm, I'm quite sold on the fact that warehouses are not the same as poor old Bista got stung with Mars factory which we did. What I'm trying to say to you is that yes, that's fine. We're councillors, that's fine. Except in your backyard, which I'll come to in a minute. How do we convince Joe Public that we need them? That is the big thing, because a warehouse, you put up a warehouse, doesn't matter what you call it. It's anti, anti, anti. And I think sometimes the designs might, might help. I know they need to be big, but somehow make them so when they are built, they're not quite so stark, and it does take a lot of time for the vegetation. I understand all that. But it's Joe Public we've got to get to. And the one thing that we have not mentioned that is in everybody's lips, and I know why the town centre, Barry's just said, it's half his fault because he got gone line shopping. How are we going to develop that? It's fine developing everything else, but actually, your workers are going to have to go shopping, or have some pleasure time, or have... Do you understand that it's not all that? It's good sports, it's good this, it's good infrastructure that needs to come along with the prosperity. Otherwise, people aren't going to want to live here. 
So unless we do make it a nice place to live, your businesses won't come here. And Joe Public on Facebook needs to be changing why they like Vista, not why they hate it. And the other question I was just going to ask, in this logistics world, I don't presume that Brexit's going to have much effect on it because it doesn't matter where you are in the world, people are going to buy. Would I be right in that, that shouldn't have to worry about Brexit too much? Okay, uh, John, do you want to, uh, you knew I was coming to you, didn't you? Well, as Debbie well, knows, at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can see Debbie looking at me when she's talking about that. Um, I suppose in my spare time from Vista Vision, I was responsible for building a lot of shops in the middle of Vista <laughs> and a cinema, etc. cetera. Um, I think you're absolutely right, Debbie, uh, that this, the whole image of logistics is the man on the forklift truck. And, and, I, and I think the logistics industry needs to spend more time making not just the councillors, but the general public aware of what, what actually goes on in these buildings, because there's some fantastic things. Difficult to do, Henry, I understand. But, 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 but I think that's important. I think coupled with that, as this town grows, it has to have more and more facilities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, 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 the one thing I would say, is Barry should stop shopping online. <laughs> because that'll fill the shops, but it won't. <laughs> no, but joking, joking apart, uh, I think shopping has become a leisure experience. People go to shops, not necessarily just because they want to go and buy a pair of shoes. They want to walk around the town. They want to enjoy the experience of walking around the town. And there's a lot of work going on that I'm aware of in Vista to improve the whole experience of the town. Um, but as the town grows and more and more people are here, it needs those facilities, Debbie's absolutely right, to stop people commuting out. What do we do with the empty shops we've got now? Right. Because it has to be, if a rate to go down, something has to go down. Mm. Because it is not possible for anybody in Bristol to go to Bristol and fill an empty shop. And that's, I'm repeating what Joe Public says. Mm. It's a very difficult one to answer that. Uh, I mean, it is a really difficult one to answer. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know, I know. And I'm not sure that any of us can really answer that. I'm going to give it to Henry because he's going to have a go. It's not business. We have developments all over the UK. It's not a problem which is sold to Bista. What we're seeing is it's across the whole country. And what planners are trying to grapple with is changing town centres from a shopping experience to a leisure experience. And people are having different degrees of success. I'd say Northampton have probably had the worst of it, whereas Leicester have been amazing. If you go to Leicester City Centre, it's fantastic and it's vibrant, the shops are full. And they, Northampton now has almost died, really. And it, it's, it's a whole sea change in, pa in shopping patterns, which affect, and we, we're only sort of at the start of that at the moment. And it's going to unfold. And what, what needs to be happening is it's, you know, it's led by the planning teams and the council with a foresight to try and work out how they're going to do it, whether that's pedestrianisation, inward investment, reinvestment of rates from other buildings into it. You know, as you mentioned, rates, holidays. But it's a recreation of a whole different cultural shift into making town centres not a shopping experience, but a leisure experience. And it's down to individual local authorities to try and address that. And some have done very good jobs and some haven't. OK, thanks. Um, the second part of the question was about Brexit. Andy, do you want to give us a view on that? Who knows what Brexit's going to bring? I wish, I wish we did know. Uh, I wish we had a... Uh, a Prime Minister who could provide a bit of leadership through this particular difficult period of time, yeah. actually. Uh, but we won't get political, because that's not what we're here for. But, but don't get me started about Brexit. Um, as, a, as, a, as a small business owner, um, you know, it, it's very uncertain uh, and very disruptive, I think. However, with all that said, to your point, Debbie, irrespective of bre Brexit, trade will happen, you know. Uh, retail, retail will happen. Leisure will happen. Uh, People will buy houses, they will buy cars, they, they will go on holiday, they will buy clothes, they will buy food. Life is going to go on. Life is not going to stop. Um, I think the bureaucrats in Brussels and, and the government that we've got at the moment will hopefully sort it out eventually. Um, but we are where we are, and, and we're going to have to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Yes, gentlemen, there.
Charles Roten Lee from Savills in Oxford. I think there's a lot of very, very good points have been made this evening, particularly by John, about planning for the future. And I think what you have got the advantage of is that you're holding events like this to tackle the future questions. I'm at the moment looking for a company in Milton Keynes. We were looking purely in Milton Keynes for an 80,000 square foot warehouse. It doesn't exist. So what's happened? The search area has been expanded to 30 miles from the centre of Milton Keynes, and Vista is now in that search area. Banbury is now in that search area. This will be very good for Cherwell if they come here, because whilst they occupy a warehouse-style building inside it, they are a dynamic business who do very exciting jobs and work, as has been discussed this evening. I think the centre that you are in here with the uh, the Oxford-Cambridge Expressway coming, whether it goes through Vista or whether it goes south of Oxford, will be announced very shortly. But I think you have got the opportunity to future-proof the town, because if you don't future-proof it, you will lose business from, from the town. And you know we've been active in this sector for a long time, speak to a lot of occupiers here, and we know that they're looking we know that they're looking to move out of Vista to go within a 20 mile radius so that their staff will still continue to go to their, their, their premises. And that only that, that results in one thing, and that's dormitory towns, and nobody wants a dormitory town. I don't have a question, I'm just making a statement. Well, okay, thank you. Sam. Lady in the front, yeah. Alongside the announcement for um, East-West um, Expressway comes a challenge, um, as usual, from the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England. How do, how do we place ourselves so that we can overcome um, the adver adversarial um, nature of their campaign, which will gain um, traction locally, bearing in mind that we are um, surrounded by small rural, rural villages um, in which nobody wants any traffic, but everybody wants to still have their goods. H how do we face that in a um, constructive manner to ensure that um, the, the town and the surrounding area still um, gets to develop um, while people um, try to keep their green and open countryside? Thanks, Sam. Who, who'd like to take that one? <laughs> Henry. <laughs> Yeah. <coughs> it's actually the problem we face with every application we make. Um, you know, we're a very small island with 75 million people or whatever living on it. And you're, um, it's always a problem we face. Traffic generation and loss of countryside. And there's no easy answer because, quite simply, it, it, macro planning is hard. You know, HS2 has upset an awful lot of people and it's going to happen. You know, it, it, planning is very, very hard. You know, if you go to France, they've got lots and lots of different, you know, they've got lot, much higher compensation laws. So if your property's worth a pound, you might get one pound fifty. Here, if it's worth a pound, you'll fight to get 95p. And they've got more space. Here, every single planning decision affects someone, and there's no easy answer. Um, but you know, it's, has to, it's a very hard, tough decision. But that's what top-down planning is. You know, you've got to impose planning housing numbers and there's tough decisions to make where they're going to be put and infrastructure. And it's, it's always going to be difficult, whether it's the you know, people fighting to save the badgers, people against highways, people against pollution, air, noise, whatever. There's always going to be that adversarial head-to-head -head battle with planning. And there's no easy answer. Thanks, Howard. John, as the local person on the panel, would you want to add anything to that? Well, all I'd say, Sam, is there's no such thing as standing still. You're either going backwards or you're going forwards. And I think inevitably we must go forwards, forwards or die. And therefore, to find the most acceptable and ameliorating solution to the question that you posed is obviously the right answer. And that's what councils and developers are trying to work together to do. Okay, thank you. Um, Yolanta. Um, a slightly different 
um, angle on, on, on the same problem. There seems to be a lot of appetite now in Oxford City Council um, and probably many pressure groups add to that on banning all diesel vehicles from Oxford and there is talk on ex of expanding that ban um, to other places in Oxfordshire. How do you envisage such bans um, impacting on the businesses that you're in, on development of logistics and development of logistics here with the important M40 corridor? Thank you. Harold, would you like to... Uh, or John, I don't mind, no, whichever. I yeah, you were trying to pass this. it down, weren't you? Yeah. Thanks, Harold. Um, I think there's got to be a little bit of realism. Um, Oxfordshire, Oxfordshire Council and Oxford City Centre banning diesel vehicles is, is great, yeah, but the retailers have got to be supplied with products. Um, and there are ways and means of doing that, you know. It could be nighttime deliveries, but it's still a diesel vehicle. It could be a consolidation centre on the edge of the city, yeah and taking all the vehicle movements off the road and, and doing them in, in, in a consolidated way to all the retailers, but it's still a diesel vehicle. Uh, until Tesla get their, their vehicles going, I think you all saw that on the TV th this week, it looks fantastic for the electric truck that'll do 500 miles on a single charge, fantastic. But that's some way off. Um, I'm doing an interview uh, next week about driverless vehicles yeah, well, if you listen to Cl Jeremy Clarkson, you know, <laughs> that's not going anywhere either. So the reality of life, unfortunately, is that with, there's a bit of sensibility got to come into it. You know, we are going to have to service our city centres. I think evening deliveries and nighttime deliveries are absolutely essential, actually. Uh, but getting diesel vehicles off the road in the short term is a little nonsensical unless you can use drones to deliver product. Uh, and I think the jury's out on that as well, really. Tel teleportation is the way forward. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, gentleman in the back row. Thank you. Um, Adrian Lockwood. I'm Oxlep board member, also local business. Um, I'd like to just comment, echo some of the things. I also chair the skills board in Oxfordshire, and we're very aware of the challenges of the, you know, of, of upskilling for modern logistics, and that forms very much part of our policy in supporting it. I mean, people aren't aware. Um, however, it isn't just warehousing, because if you take the example of BMW, um, they employ as many people in logistics as they do in actually screwing minis together. And those people aren't in a warehouse. They're planning the process. So logistics is wider than just a warehouse moving goods. Um, and I think the other point on logistics is that it's, uh, uh, as an economist, um, it's not just about serving um, residential needs in terms of shopping and all the rest of it, because those people have to have jobs. And so logistics forms a balanced part of the economy. Uh, there must be other sectors, and of course it's, it, it's important to Oxfordshire that actually the need for logistics will grow out of the growth of innovation and small techno high technology companies, which are very typical of our economy here. Um, the one question I really wanted to come back on to was, was the realism of tempering this with the local infrastructure. You know, some of the quotes in terms of um, how quickly you can get down to the M4 on the A34. I know plenty of times a day that it's going to take you a little bit longer than that. And similarly, the A41, even getting down from here, just down to the M40, or the A43, you know, getting up to the M1. So we need to be realistic about what other infrastructure is needed aside from warehouses. Um, and I also echo the comments about what is needed in terms of, you know, keeping the local facilities for the local population. Um, I'm glad the subject of East West connectivity has come up because it would, it's a very hot topic and there'll be more announcements and you're talking about the next 15 years. The first thing that will be built will be the rail. 
the expressway will take longer than the rail link will. Um, and we mentioned BMW. 80% of their vehicles leave by rail. We've got Vista Garrison here. A significant amount of Vista Garrison's uh, freight has been moved by rail. We seem to be concentrating on road logistics. What opportunities are there for us to grow as a logistics centre, as a rail centre? I mean, JLR is another one that's mentioned in here, and unfortunately, 80% of their output clogs the A34, heading for Southampton docks. So what, what might we do in terms of other uh, forms of technology, in terms of rail, and of course, autonomous vehicles is another one upcoming within 15 years. Thank you. Uh, Howard. Sorry, Henry. We're, um, we're actually at the, in the process at the moment to work up a planning application for a railhead scheme um, at Hinkley, which is uh, 6.5 million square feet on a 500-acre site. And an enormous amount of planning went into where that scheme should go. Because you've got to be rail-centric, so you have to be able to get by rail from one of the inland from the port. So if Southampton, Ipswich and Felixstowe, your main three, Thames Gateway is already pretty much self-contained and consumes its own smoke. So deep water ports now had a billion pounds spent on it by Peel. And the idea is they haven't got much logistics land with the port. So the freight comes in there, trying to get into the middle of the country. Felixstowe, the government had just spent £40 million pounds putting a new link around the back of Ipswich to try and get freight onto the rail. They're trying to get three quarters of a million lorries off the A14 a year. So they're trying to free up the whole rail network. But the trouble is, the government aren't really that keen to spend that much money on sorting it out, and they haven't really put the policy in place yet to enable it to happen. Also, our systems are completely log-jammed at the moment. Solutions, so on freight heading north-south, when it gets to Northampton, they have a, a shuttle route, and what happens is all the freight eventually shuttles it up together, and it goes in a big loop and slows around, around Northampton. All the fast trains then go past, then it joins back on the system and carries on again, and then there's another loop further north. It's, it's archaic, to be honest. And Network Rail are trying to solve the problem. But the biggest hindrance, you'll laugh, is the width of our gauges, because we have W8 and W10 gauge rail tracks, and European freight can only go on a W10 gauge, and some W10 gauge tracks don't have wide enough bridges for European containers. So we spent a large amount of money with a very um, eccentric rail expert who happened to know about all the, rich, the bridge widths in the UK to work out where the best place was to put a railhead site. And everyone's laughing. This took about two years. Um, and we're now in the process of working up a planning application. And because it's a railhead site, it doesn't form under local planning. It falls under national guidance. So it's a um, development consent order application, which isn't dealt with by the local authority. So if one were to happen here, it wouldn't fall under Cherwell's mandate. It would fall under the Secretary of State. So whilst you'd be a consultant, consultee to the application, you'd be no more than really like you know, just a, even an objector or a, a promoter of it. <laughs> the scale of them to make them justifiable is enormous. And it, you've got to be a minimum, really, of 5 million square feet for a railhead terminal to actually be justified because of the cost of the rail infrastructure itself. Because you'd probably lose about 25 to 30 acres of hard standing just for the railhead. Then you've got to have two in and out points. So you're looking at you know, 50, 60 million pounds of infrastructure just for the railhead. And that would just about break even. And that large part of that is financed by the land cost. So when you look around Cherwell, and you look at the current um, where the rail lines are at the moment, and the network capacity, and the bridge widths, and the width of the range of gain, which width of the tracks, you can't find anywhere to put it, to be honest. And, and believe me, we've looked. <laughs> um, so rail at the moment, it's about 1% of all freight in the UK goes by rail. They're trying to make it more, but there are massive constraints in the system. And I, d I don't think Cherwell at the moment has the infrastructure to be able to accommodate it. OK, thank you. Uh, let's Hopefully, uh, I might have a question for all of you. Um, I've got four questions, really, uh, which to ask. First, the first one is about um, unemployment. Um, as you're probably well aware, in, in Vista, we're, I think, fairly low in terms of unemployment. And we're already businesses are having to go further field in order to fill whatever vacancies they have at the moment in time. So I see um, there's a great deal of importance, one, to, you know, towards the schools and the mentoring um, sort of scheme. So that's my first question. How would you 
combat that because you're actually going to um, increase the, the, the growth of the town in terms of business opportunities and, and employment. Um, the next one is about the, the location of um, logistics. It's very, very important that we do get that right because the, one of the biggest concerns here in Vista is that we mix in logistics, warehousing, with uh, residential areas. And that is a major concern for people. So, you know, if they're sort of looking out of their, their windows and they see a big building in front of them, um, that's not very good news. So I just wonder how it is important to get the location uh, right as far as uh, warehousing is concerned. Then it follows through that you, in order to feed wherever the good locations are, you need a good road network as well to be able to access it and to, to move to other parts of the country. Yes, the M40 is a great help in, in that regards, and you've got the two rail stations as well, and you've just been speaking about the possibility of the rail links that we, that we have got around on the MOD site. Um, the other thing, coming back to uh, the town centre as well, it is important that people like yourselves uh, do try and influence uh, and protect the, the vitality and the viability of, of town centres, and especially Vista. I mean, that's the, the, the number one issue at the moment. Uh, local residents go out there and see that the town um, centre is not really thriving in the way it is. There's been a lot of improvements done, and that's kept it going at this moment in time. But we, I think we need to really focus in on that as well, because by, doing, by looking after your town centre, then you're going to look after the, the new em uh, employees that, that come in to, you know, for the businesses as well. And I think you said it earlier on, really, that um, also the town centre needs to provide the sort of facilities um, for a growing town. And at the moment, we're not getting that sort of um, message right. But the, the other important thing, which I think we missed out, you said it was a leisure, but it's also a, show, a, a social activity going into your town centre. And that's really important, that is. And that sends out the sort of the right messages. And um, I think I'll leave it like that for now. Okay, yeah, uh, John, would you like to uh, take those, or some of them? Can I take some of them? I'll try and take the easier ones. <laughs> um, uh, where, where, where do we start? I think in terms of, of, of the perceived conflict between logistics and residential, that is about good town planning. That's about organising not only the site and its surroundings, but also the ability to get to it and from it. And I think, I think that is key. Having said all of that, the, the point you started with, Les, was about, well, we haven't got much unemployment. But that, that isn't really the point. We've got a huge percentage of out commuters at the moment. And as time moves forward, certainly one of the things that we've talked about lots at this division has been creating opportunities for the people who live in this town and will come to live in this town, but actually don't want to get on a train and go to London in the morning. They don't want to get on a train and go even to Oxford in the morning. Well, yeah, no, I, I accept it. Yeah, I, I absolutely accept the current situation, but I think this is a situation that, that will change, and I think what's going on here is going to make a big difference to that as well in this building. Uh, I think what, what you say, I try to say about the sort of social activity of just going to town and, 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 and walking around. You go to lots of European towns where there's all sorts of cafe society and this sort of thing. Now, maybe our, maybe our climate doesn't suit some of this, but actually the sort of activities that people socially want to undertake could be in the town centre. Um, this division were, 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 were quite keen not to see the preponderance of uh, retail and leisure facilities out of the town centre. Um, and, and there was the case at Kingsmere that, 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 that arose that, that was, I think, resolved on appeal in the end. And the Secretary of State decided that was absolutely fine. So there's a gym going out there with some restaurants and things, but there's a gym going out there that actually could have been in the town centre or close to the town centre. It's that sort of conversation. But our towns have to be pleasant places to be. New housing, new facilities in the town centre. There's a bit of a chicken and egg here. The more people are here, the more attractive it will be for operators in the town centre to provide those facilities. You, you can't wave a magic wand, Les, you know better than anybody, but, it, but it, it, it's an evolution, really. Uh, and I think we have to plan for the future in that way. Uh, Henry, do you want, us, do you want to pick up the... 
I suppose most of, if you look at the successful logistics warehouse parks on large scale, they're on motorway junctions. Um, you know, traffic jo drops on and off the motorway and disappears off to, you know, it comes in and out, whether it's from a port or wherever, and goes off to you know, smaller warehouses, whatever it is. Motorway junctions are good places for logistics warehouses. A comment Councillor Pickford made, it does take time for landscape to grow up. Um, it's a long game. If you look at Magna Park, you can't actually see it as you drive past it anymore. They've got three metre high buns that were planted 15 years ago. You wouldn't know it's there as you drive past it. Something which is important and which we've done on some of our parks is shuttle buses in and out of towns. So you're talking about you know, people got to spend money in a town to make it successful. If they're set up right through 106s, shuttle bus at lunch times, at break time, you know, when people break up for um, end of the day, if people can get into a town, they'll spend money. And it's something we have done on several parks is you know, if there's a shuttle bus at lunchtime, so you know, people work shifts in warehouse a lot of the time. You know, if, there's a, if there's a lunch break for an hour at one, there's a bus in, there's a bus out. You know, over a number of years, that makes an awful lot of spend into a town. And actually, the 106 needs to actually accommodate that it's a, me, it's a needs test. So you know, if one bus is successful, there should be two buses. If two buses successful, there's three. Um, there's no point having three buses with no one on them. All you're doing is putting diesel into the town. But it, it needs to be looked at as how do you connect a development to a town because it's the spend that's going to rejuvenate the town centre. Okay. Location, location of the well, that's going back to the motorway junction point. If you look at in Northampton alone, you've got junctions 15, 16, and 15A have all got logistics warehouses on them. Two of those are cheap by general residential, and they're not our schemes. Um, they've been hugely successful, and the strategic planting has worked over the years. You know, at day one, it, admittedly, it probably does look like a bit of a moonscape because the landscaping hasn't caught hold. But over a number of years, it does. And um, you know, if you look at Grange Park or Pynham, they've been huge successes from an occupational and residential point of view. Um, but the traffic does drop onto the motorway, and that's quite important. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, sure. Sean Jardine from Bredesen Solicitors. Um, it's recently been announced that Banbury has succeeded in its application for bid funding to become a business improvement district and uh, taking that into account the fact that Milton Keynes have applied for them, Leamington have had them, uh, Rugby have had them. I just wonder, isn't it inevitable that Bicester would be improved as a town centre if it was to apply to become a business improvement district? Thank you. I think that's going to be difficult, isn't it? panel-wise. Um, yeah, I think it's something we'd, that we did say that we would we would look at. We wanted to see the, the Banbury uh, bid off the ground. Um, the vote last week was, was positive, so the next stage now is to is to set that up. Uh, and then I think it's something we, c we can look at. Uh, but I think to, to try and do the two at the same time would have probably been uh, a little difficult. But it is yeah, definitely something that would, uh, for the future. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the out commuting point, I think John, you're making as well. Um, have any of the logistics investors mapped out the types of out commuter? Who is out commuting from Vista in order then to inform their investment decision <coughs> as to putting a logistics or other um, operation in the town? Do we know, you know is, is background work being done that can be perhaps introduced now and um, shared? like pass the microphone, isn't it? Yeah. I think, Steve, you found an absolutely great job for you here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think it's, I think it's a very interesting issue, just because you only have to stand on Bister North Station in the morning, assuming you can get on Bister North Station in the morning, to see what it is. And it's not just executives going to London, it's all sorts of people. So that information would be very helpful. I don't know if it exists or not, frankly. Certainly, we, we haven't come across it. Um, it would be very interesting to see it, but um, we, we haven't got any of that data. Yeah, I just wonder how much of this is a chicken and egg situation as well, because you know the people that are going to move to Vista are, are either going to use the centre and, and help it grow, or they're going to come here and establish patterns where they don't do that and they reinforce the current situation where, that, that we have. 
Just thinking about me, personally, as an example, and that um, I knew I was moving to Bristol, I was looking for housing all, all around. I ended up living, uh, really, that was guided by relatives, so I'm, I'm quite a way out and I drive in. But I lived somewhere that was on a rail station before Vista Village Station was completed, uh, hoping that that would be an option. And the reality is that it isn't. So I can get to Oxford and get to Vista, but all of the lines are set up and the timings are set up that you get to London and you can't really get anywhere else and the connections don't really work. So I think that's a little bit, again, about that sort of joined up um, thinking. And, um, I, and I'm sure it's a nightmare about developing roads and bypasses of villages and all the rest of it. But, but again, I think you know the villages around here are fairly gridlocked at a time after when I drive. But I know that that happens. And I think it does have to be something has to happen, whotha it 's bypasses of pretty Cotswold towns or, or whatever, but I think that there's development that just hasn 't happened for twenty thirty forty years, so something absolutely has to happen there, and the reality is that you know people are going to live in these areas and are going to need to commute into Bicester and a bus or whatever isn 't going to be a, a, a realistic alternative uh, and the other thing I just wanted to say is we were talking about um, big uh, warehouse units and what they look like and um, I completely sort of agree that you know, once the landscaping's happened, and even if you set a slightly different standard, and again, when I drive into the town where I live, the buildings are sort of dressed in stone and what have you, and they, they don't look like big, ugly warehouses. They look a, like a very well-established extension of the town. And, and again, you know, I think that Bristol has got a really high-quality town centre with loads of potential, and as a standard, you know, if Bista was to develop and so on, well, let's build on that aesthetic. Then again, those warehouses and how they look and how they settle in uh, can really be an asset to the town in time, as long as they go in the right place. Okay, thank you, Richard. Just to take up um, Steve's point, I think it's something that we could take to a, a, a Bista Vision meeting to start kicking around and seeing what, uh, how that information might be obtained, what we would need to do. I'm hoping Steve will help. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Yes. Stephen Clues from Bidwells. Um, we're working on lots of uh, sort of, you know, sort of shed schemes around the, around the county for various science and technology uh, sort of park owners. Um, they put a lot of emphasis on the landscaping as being the, 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 the big selling point for, for both the people that work there as well as sort of a visual aesthetic for for people that sort of you know drive by and um, basically, uh, I, I think if you're if you're going to start sort of imposing rules on on the developers for uh, the shed the shed buildings, then it will make it less attractive. For, so I think basically, if the council are going to start sort of uh, looking to to impose restrictions, they have to do it with a, a, a mind that it has to be economic in its in its outlook for for uh, for development. So. I think probably just to, to answer that, I know that when in the planning process, the uh, landscaping of, of the buildings is certainly a, a, a one of the things that, that we take uh, very seriously, I think, at Charwell in terms of making, the, uh, making it as attractive as possible. And I, but I do take your point that that comes at a, at a cost. Um, I, what, what I would say, if you want to see landscaping taken to the extreme, on your way home, pop into Vista Village and just look at the sheer number of trees um, that, are, that are scattered around in Vista Village and you'll, uh, you'll see that the new extension doesn't look as though it's particularly new. And I think that's, you know, that's something which uh, is, is certainly on at their end of the market is, uh, is, is something that they can do. It's just a comment, really, uh, going back to the very beginning when we said about how do we convince Joe Public out there. I think the use of the word sheds and warehouses has got to go. And they've got to be called whatever you dress them up as, but sheds and warehouses do not... It's not right. And I, I don't know whether you call them logistic centres or, or whatever, but I think we need to get away from that mindset of calling them that because that's nothing irritates 
Joe Public more on Facebook than that. Um, and a, a lot of things do irritate the public, uh, you know, too true, in, in particularly in this town. Um, but I think this has been a really good session. And as the lead member for Estates and Economy at at Cherwell District Council. I think it's been really good and good to air a lot of the problems. And, and we know we're not the only town centre, certainly going through Angst, where I come from, north again, uh, the northern towns of Blackburn, Accrington, where I came from, are dying, really. And uh, it's very sad to see, but let's hope that in the future something can be done with that. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I think in, in terms of the town centre, and I think we've seen on the recent reports on the Mary Porter's towns, the, the money spent worked for the first few weeks, and then they're in the same situation as the rest of us. And I think we have to acknowledge that the shopping uh, trends have changed, and that we, we, you know, we need, town centres need to respond, and there need to be more things that you can't get online, uh, so it's it's service services etc. And I know we're working with the town centre traders to try and work through what we can do to to build up the town centre. Um, on the second point, it's interesting because fulfilment centre sounds a lot better than a than a, than a large shed. Yeah. Henry, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. We always start out calling them fulfilment centres or a variety of things. But within a week, there's an action group on Facebook calling them nasty big shed warehouses. And you know, when, when it's labelled, and then it, when it gets to planning committee, you know, people who are opposing the schemes will stand up and say, we don't want these big sheds, and they want warehouses. Um, and actually, just one point on the how they look, they're very much Marmite. You know, we can come up with 20 different designs and colourings, and we'll get 20 different answers. And we've tried everything. And, and then suddenly someone like um, Big Yellow Box will come along and want one bright yellow. So it, it's always a very contentious issue. One thing that Cherwell were really good at, actually, our, our Banbury scheme, was we end up having dark roofs. So when you're on top of the hill beyond Carter School, look down, actually, they, do, they, they don't stand out nearly as much. The first generation ones have got white roofs, and they do stand out. And the latter ones have got um, graphite grey. Um, but it, the elevations, they are what they are, and that, that is the hard part. You know, they're 18 metres to ridge. You can have curved roofs, you can have elevations, you, know, you can have parapet walls. In the end, you know, they are big old boxes. Um, and when it comes to planning committee, people will object and call them warehouses and sheds. OK, thank you. <laughs> any, any more questions? OK, well, thank you all for, for coming. There is still some tea and coffee and um, orange juice there. And if you want to please carry on and, and network and have, have discussions. And can I say a big thank you to our... Uh, our four panelists for their contribution today, because I think that, as I think um, Lynn said, it's you know, it's been very interesting, and hopefully it's something that uh, we'll do again in the you know, in, in the future. And I think a special thanks to Richard for uh, allowing us to use the school, and to the staff here who've who've looked after us. And I think it's it's good. So thank you all very much, and have a safe journey. <laughs>